Good. We're good. Great. Thank you and good evening to the Monomoy Regional School Committee's meeting for Thursday, June 25th at 6.30, held via uh, Zoom. This meeting is being held fully remotely in accordance with the Governor of Massachusetts' March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GLC 30A, Section 20. You can join our meeting at the link provided on our website, as well as the meeting ID and passwords available. I'd like to call the meeting to order at 6.35 p.m., um, first item on the agenda tonight would be the approval of the minutes from the June 11th, 2020 meeting. I would move to approve the minutes, uh, minutes of the meeting of June 11th. Thank Second. Back to that. I think that was Joanne. Um, and any questions or discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to do a roll call. Nancy? Aye. Terry? Aye. Joanne? Yes. And Joe? Aye. Mary? Aye. And I'm going to abstain. OK, next time on the agenda would be public comment. Speakers are limited to five minutes. Um, is there anyone that'd like to speak this evening in the beginning? Or there's another option um, at the end. Charles, good evening. If everyone can remember, just mute while Charles is speaking. That would be great. Good, good evening. Thank you. Charles Griska, 6 Tiberi Ave, Harwich, Mass. and. Uh, this evening, as a member of the public, I just want to express to the school committee uh, kudos and appreciation for three members of the administrative leadership team uh, who are coming to their final hours here in the district um, and share my perspective uh, on, on and my appreciation. Uh, Katie Icernio, Mark Wilson, and Bill Burkhead. Uh, when I first moved to Harwich in 2015, one of the first concerns that I had was what was the situation for the school budget uh, in the Monomoy district, uh, having moved from a community where I was an, a strong advocate for better school budgeting, having worked in a school district that was always suffering from inadequate school budgeting. Uh, I was very curious as to what the situation would be in my new community as far as the schools and see whether there was anything that needed to be done further about that. So that's what prompted me to attend my uh, first school committee meeting in the Monomoy district was when we were beginning one year to uh, begin the, the presentation on the budget. And uh, I came to learn as much as I could about the budget situation in Monomoy. At the end of the meeting, I introduced myself to uh, Katie Icernio after she had made a presentation at the meeting um, just to uh, express my interest and to let her know that I may have some questions. And she strongly encouraged me to be in contact with her at any time if I had questions. Well, I did have some questions. And so I, I sent her an, an email uh, asking if we could do a phone call, a short phone call to answer a couple of questions. And she responded back, inviting me to come in to meet at the central office to uh, express my uh, questions personally. Uh, which was uh, a happy surprise to me and, and, and it made me a bit nervous, quite frankly, to take up the time, valuable time of the administration with an in-person meeting. Um, but when I arrived, Katie had out for me this huge packet of materials that she had put together regarding the budget. And she sat down with me and walked me through the materials on the budget and gave me a 101 course on the Monomoy budget. I think we spent a good hour and a half, which was just an amazing amount of time for an administrator to give to any one single person from the general public. And that began a relationship which made me comfortable not only with Katie, but with the entire school district to raise any questions or concerns. And I've done that several times with Kate uh, over uh, the years I've been here. Uh, after that, a couple of people whom I knew in Harwich I uh, joined the Harwich Finance Committee and they knew that I was really studying out budget situations in Harwich and so they began calling me with questions and I began to encourage them to go to Katie uh, to get those answers saying that I'm not the final authority and I don't know uh, everything. I don't want to be presenting inaccurate information. They were hesitant to do that, but happily, eventually they did. And they had very positive experiences with Katie and expressed that to me. And I think anytime you can get other town officials to have a great respect and enthusiasm for the business operation of the school district, that's a major, major contribution. And so uh, I wanted you to know that and I wanted to uh, express thanks and appreciation and kudos 
to Katie in that regard. About uh, four, four years ago this October, my grandson and his family moved up from Texas uh, and moved in with us in Harwich and the grandchildren began school in the Harwich public schools. And my grandson started in the sixth grade and began uh, partway through the school year at the middle school under Mark Wilson. And that gave me an opportunity as a grandparent to attend several uh, meetings, programs, presentations, and which I was really amazed and very enthusiastic in what I saw with Mark and the way he read, led the school. I really was uh, impressed at his presentations at school committee meetings, the work that's been done to improve the achievement of students uh, through their middle school years, and especially impressed when he presented about the efforts Monomoy Middle School under his leadership was making to make sure that every single student in that school had at least one other person who they felt they could be comfortable with if they had a concern. Uh, most schools are, good schools are concerned about the competence of their students. The best schools are concerned about competence and caring. And um, Mark demonstrated that to the highest degree. And when I was part of the process to select the new uh, principal to replace Mark, I came to learn how much the students, parents and faculty of the middle school re regarded him and what a phenomenal principal he was. The same can be said of Bill Burkhead at the high school. The reason that I'm as involved as I am with the school system on a volunteer basis, probably the main person responsible for that is Bill Burkhead. I put my name in, submitted it to participate in the NEASC self-study group. And as a result of that, uh, Bill immediately introduced himself, invited me to come in, spend time with him, ask questions. And that started uh, a long relationship that got me involved in, in a number of things, spending a lot of time at the high school, totally impressed with what he, the leadership he's shown to make the Monomoy, the students home away from home and make everyone feel important. He genuinely deserved to be the principal of the year, as far as I'm concerned, principal of the year in the country uh, last year. I've, I've known many, many principals, none, none better than Bill Burkhead. So wish him well in his new system in Situate, have friends in Situate, have grandchildren in the school system. They're really enthused about that. And uh, for Mark and, and Katie, uh, job well done. And as a long-term member of the club, I wanna welcome them uh, into the great uh, society where every night is Friday night, every morning is Saturday morning, and Sunday night is the best time of the week. Uh, so kudos to them. I've experienced the same things I've shared with ongoing members of the leadership team. I've experienced it with the superintendent with Mark, with uh, Melissa McGuire, with the principals, Robin Millen and Mary Oldak. Um, but for those people who are ending their time with the district, uh, hats off and I hope I speak on behalf of the community. I know that the community at large has highest regards for those three individuals from my interactions with that part of the community that does not have children in the school that are my age level and yet are supporting the school with their taxes. Uh, and they have a great respect for the school system and enthusiasm. And the three people that we salute tonight have an awful lot to do with that. And I think some major contribution that they've made. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to share my perspectives from the community uh, on those individuals. Thank you, Charles, very much. Um, and we are going to move on to our next item agenda and um, item on the agenda, excuse me, um, would be recognitions. Dr. Carpenter. I, I would like to uh, uh, ditto what uh, Charles said about Katie. Uh, I think uh, I was able to drop Ray off here at the Air Force Academy um, this morning without tears. Uh, next Tuesday, when Katie has her last day, I'm not sure I'm going to make it without tears. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure you're making it right now. <laughs> um, I, I want to give a huge shout out to uh, the Harwich and Chatham uh, members of public safety who helped make a wonderful processional through our community during graduation happen. Uh, it was uh, you know, it was absolutely fabulous, and it was great to uh, ride in the uh, one of the cars up front uh, with Bill Massey. He actually let me ride in the front, not the back. I was a little bit worried um, if I was going to be behind you know, behind bars in the back. 
Um, but uh, uh, but it was you know as we as we went along on that route, there were just so many community members that just kept saying thank you, you know, thank you for making this happen, you know, for the kids. And I want to thank public safety for making that happen. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the uh, make the thanks for a donation of hundreds of vegetable seedlings from the Barnesville County Cape Cod Cooperative Extension. Uh, we were able to offer free vegetable plants to our families. The seedlings were grown and tended by master gardeners and are available um, to be picked up at our grab and go meal service at the middle school in Chatham and the high school in Harwich on Friday, May 29th. Uh, thanks to Cape Cod Cooperative Extension for making this possible for our families. Many thanks to a, a large donation of books uh, uh, from Brooks Free Library, as well as from teachers and community members. We were able to offer free book giveaway to our families, handing out approximately 700 free books to our students in early June. In addition, the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance also donated hundreds of marine activity books for us to give to our families. So thank you there. And lastly, a great big shark shout out and thank you to the Wayside Inn and Mr. and Mrs. Oppenheim for the $5,390.29 uh, donation of food to the Chatham Elementary Food Pantry. Uh, Mr. Oppenheim has committed to continue these donations until the end of June and we are truly grateful or how supportive the town and community have been through all of this. And that's it for me. Great, thank you very much. All great stuff. Um, very thankful for everything. Um, next item on the agenda would be reports and discussions. First item under reports and discussions would be updating the timeline for chair and vice chair for F121. Um, just kind of a point of clarification, Dr. Carpenter, and I um, wanted to just move forward, um, letting everyone know kind of what, where we stand and how we're gonna proceed from here. Um, I think it's important to go back to the regional agreement and I'm gonna be reading below me. So just so you guys understand that. Um, each member, the election of the members, because we have a kind of a unique situation this year with Chatham already having held its town meeting and its elections. Harwich will be um, not having their town meeting until the fall. However, their elections are gonna be held on June 30th. The two members of the Harwich committee who are up for re-election would be Sharon Stout and Mary Henderson, and they are um, running unopposed. Um, however, the member that has not, a member who has not otherwise vacated his or her seat will continue to serve until his or her successor is elected and sworn in. And that is how in the original agreement it reads and why we are allowed to continue to proceed um, accordingly. Um, after that would be the organization of the committee. Um, and I'm just gonna read direct from the regional agreement so that everyone understands. Um, at the first scheduled meeting of the regional district school committee after the annual election of all member towns, the regional district school committee shall organize in accordance with the Massachusetts general laws, chapter 71, section 16A, known as regional school committee organization. In addition, the regional school district committee shall fix the times and place for its regular meetings for the new term provide for calling of special meetings upon written or electronic notice to all its members and appoint appropriate subcommittees and other offices. So, excuse me, officers. So after our next meeting, I believe is scheduled for July 9th. At that time, Harwich will have already elected um, its members. Chatham's um, poll was closed tonight at six. So we will know shortly about that as well. Um, the two members for Chatham will be sworn in before the July 9th meeting and the two members for Harwich will be sworn in before the July 9th meeting. Um, at the July 9th meeting, um, I will ask for a nomination for the chair. I will not ask for a nomination for the chair, but at the, at the July, go ahead, Scott, you can take it from here because I might mess it up. Well, typically what happens, I, I'm the one that, that it's, the, it's the only time I you get are. to open a meeting. So I'll, I'll open That's the right. meeting. That's right. You run that one. See, I knew it was a little fuzzy. I, I, get to run, I get to run it for five minutes and then I turn it over to whoever gets New elected chair. chair. Perfect. I knew I had it messed up. Okay. So at that time, Dr. Carpenter will run the meeting for his moment in the light. And um, 
we'll do a motion for chair and a motion for vice chair. And then the following meeting, we get to do the subcommittee stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Mr. Osceola, did you have a question? Just limiting the time of the superintendent's uh, coup d'etat of the school committee. Got it. Every minute matters. Okay. Um, are there any questions or, com or discussion for the chair and vice chair? Okay, seeing none. Moving on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, the Chatham Annual Town Meeting was held Monday evening at Veterans Field. Um, and uh, the chat, the budget, um, our school budget did pass at that town meeting. I was unable to attend that town meeting, um, but Ms. Scott was able to attend. And I just didn't know, Ms. Scott, if there's anything you'd like to add regarding the town meeting. No, there were no questions, no conversation about our budget. It sailed through lovely. Okay, great. It was the best town meeting ever. It was about 40 minutes long. It was a, that's a record. Mm -hmm. um, and are there any other questions or discussion regarding the annual town meeting update? Okay, we were gonna move forward with the Matamoy Regional School Committee summer meeting schedule. Um, I spoke with Leah briefly and, and I've also spoken with Scott. Um, typically, we like to reserve some time in the summer to maybe not have four meetings, um, maybe have one in each month. Um, I think we found ourselves in a very unique um, situation this year. And I think it's important that we focus and we most likely will have to have two meetings in July and two in August. There's gonna be a lot of timely things on our agenda. Um, that are going to need our attention, um, and I I am in full support of that. But we want to we want to discuss what that meeting looks like. Um, we usually try and keep it to the same schedule: second Thursday, fourth Thursday, I think is what it is, um, every month. Um, and after looking at the calendar, there is a little bit of leeway in August. But where the teachers are returning back to school August 27th and our students are returning August 31st, as we previously voted um, prior to Labor Day, I think that we should make sure that we, our schedule kind of pushes more towards the earlier part of August. So right now the tentative schedule looks like July 9th and then July 23rd, August 6th, and then August 20th. Um, bear in mind, there may be a budget issues and things in the air, we may have to adjust that, but that's the tentative schedule as of right now. Are there any questions, comments about um, that schedule as it stands? No, everybody's good. Okay, I think everybody's been absolutely excellent about changes in schedules and having to add things last minute to the agenda given our circumstances. So I um, appreciate the support. Um, for us to have to have the four meetings this summer. And Joe, yes. I, just if you would repeat the dates as I'm writing them down. Absolutely, um, July 9th, July 23rd, mm -hmm. August 6th, and August 20th. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Dr. Carpenter, is there anything else about those dates or are those okay? Those seem... They sound great. Okay, great. All right, uh, moving on to uh, the, the last item on the reports and discussions. Um, we have the appointment of Michael McMillan as the representative to the Cape Cod Municipal Health Group. Um, and I can uh, just kind of point on that. The, the regional school district is a member of the Cape Cod Municipal Health Group through which the district obtains its health and dental insurances. The business manager is the designated voting member to the group. It was previously Katie. Um, a vote should be taken uh, this evening to appoint Michael McMillan, Monomoy Regional School District's business manager as the approved voting member to CCMHG, the Cape Cod Municipal Health Group. The approved school committee vote minutes should then be sent to them for their records. So um, I would like to see if there is a motion um, to approve Michael McMillan as the designated voting member to the Cape Cod Municipal Health Group. Would anyone like to make that motion? Ms. Scott. 
I move sorry, to man. appoint Michael McMillan, the Monomoy Regional School District's business manager as the approved voting member to Cape Cod Municipal Health Group. Thank you. A second. second that. Joe's a second. I'm going to roll call. Just make sure to put your mics on. Uh, Ms. Scott? Aye. Oh, excuse me. Any questions or discussion? I'm so sorry. No. Okay, great. Uh, Ms. Scott? Aye. Uh, Mr. Russell? Unmute, Mr. Russell. Unmute, unmute. Just when you think he's got it. Right. Find that fun little microphone. Okay. There you uh, go. There you go. Okay, I, okay. Uh, Joanne? Yes. Uh, Joe? Aye. Mary? Aye. And Sharon, your microphone's off. Sharon? Yes, I. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, motion carries. <clears throat> and moving on to subcommittee reports. Um, we actually already have um, policy and um, superintendent evaluation under action items. So is there anything other, any other subcommittee reports besides those two? Okay, great. Seeing none, uh, superintendent's report. Uh, as you know, um, Monday was the last day of school and it was rather surreal to have a last day of school where students weren't in our buildings and heading out. Uh, but we also have, uh, have had concurrent with the last day of school, uh, a, a, a big process of uh, collecting all of the Chromebooks uh, back or working with families to get the Chromebooks back so that we can make sure that they're <laughs> conditioned and ready for the fall. And I appreciate a lot of the work that uh, that each of the buildings is doing and particularly that Tim Birchfield's doing to uh, make that process, uh, process possible. Um, graduation was uh, the following day on Tuesday. Uh, I, as I uh, mentioned at the very end of graduation, it was a, a graduation where um, Murphy's Law, um, you know, set in, you know, constantly throughout, um, you know, I've, I have in my years of being an administrator experienced uh, rain coming sideways at graduation and fleeing into gymnasiums and, and having, you know, the power go completely out in a building and having to scream out the names of the graduates. Um, uh, little did I know that fog too can uh, can wipe out uh, all of the all of the electronics. So uh, I don't think it was. I think some of the pictures that I've seen afterwards, you know, uh, may have captured how bad the fog was. But the fog was kind of crazy on our stadium field that night. And uh, and while they uh, all of the testing of the electronics during the day went seamlessly as uh, as nightfall happened and the fog rolled in. Uh, and no one was expecting uh, what it would do to the electronics. So uh, as we were uh, having pomp and circumstance and the graduates were, were coming into the stadium, the soundboard shorted out. There was a loud pop on the field, soundboard shorted out, and there was a, a brief pause uh, at, at which time we had, uh, my phone was exploding, I think, along with uh, uh, Bill Burkhead's and Joy Jordan's and yeah, I, many of us that were there, you know, sort of what's happening. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm getting I'm getting a text from my sister saying, uh, you know, saying that my son apparently is live streaming on Instagram. I I don't know. I don't Instagram, but uh, and then he was quite happy that there were apparently hundreds of people watching his feed as he was going around and interviewing graduates while we were having our little fog electrical shortage delay. The electrical shortage delay did buy us some valuable time because during the processional, despite it only being 15 miles per hour, uh, two of our students did manage to rear end each other hard enough to have airbags deploy. And uh, the deployment of the airbags caused one of the students to need six stitches. So, uh, so the fog delay did create time for the stitches to get administered at the local urgent care center and the student make it uh, 
to graduation before uh, most of the uh, uh, ceremony was happening and the diplomas uh, got passed out. So um, it was you know, it was a great event. Um, you know, there, you know, it, it it's one of those. It would have been lovely if people were at home and could see one streamless or, or seamless uh, stream. But uh, but I think you know I, I think we all adapted and and I, I even I even joked that uh, my Luddite father was able to figure out that he could go back in and see you know both my you know remarks and my son's remarks that he had missed along the way. So um, so it's nice we uh, we have on the website you know, the full graduation from beginning to end. So, uh, you know, so, uh, so it's, it's all there. And uh, I ended uh, just before uh, uh, having the tassels go from right to left and get uh, the caps get thrown in the air by presenting uh, Janie, uh, Bill and Jen, their own mortar board since they, uh, they too are transitioning uh, from, uh, you know, from, uh, work to retirement or from principal to superintendent or from assistant principal to principal. And, uh, you know, so it's, it was a, a nice, a nice celebration all around. Um, and uh, I'll be very thankful if we don't ever have to do one in the fog again. Um, I want to just pause for a second and give Joy a chance to chime in on the summer food distribution that will be happening uh, here. Hi, Joy Jordan, uh, Community Engagement Coordinator. So our official Monomoy food service program is ending tomorrow, where we've given students breakfast and lunch um, every day of the week. So we, a while back, we wanted to find a way to continue this throughout the summer. And there's an organization called Food for Kids, which normally would do this in a regular summer. They would provide lunches at community centers, rec programs, that sort of thing. So they were facing a summer that would be very different for them because the programs that they usually use to feed children aren't operating and the capacity they would need is much higher than what they're used to. Um, Nauset schools was in the same position as us where they wanted to kind of keep feeding their kids. And so the, the three of us actually got together and worked out a way to collaborate. So Food for Kids is still administering the program officially. Um, Nauset will handle the preparation of the foods and then get the reimbursements. And we will handle the <clears throat> transport of the food to our locations and delivering those um, distributing those to our families. So we will be able to continue offering free breakfast and lunch every day of the week, Monday through Friday, 9 to 11 a.m. at both the middle school and the high school. Um, we're following the same pattern. They'll get three meals on Fridays to get them through the weekend. It is going to be mostly staffed by volunteers. There's site supervisors that will be at both locations. Leah and I are sort of the lead site supervisors. So one of us will always be at one of those locations. And then we have a couple of backups for if Leah and I can't be there. And um, it's just a great way for I think all of the organizations involved to make this happen in a way that's efficient and effective for everybody and not cost prohibitive for anybody. We're lucky that our custodial team is willing to help. They're gonna be the ones who actually go pick up the meals at Nauset and bring them back to the middle school and the high school where then the volunteers and the site supervisors will distribute those to families. So we're launching that on Monday and we're, we're hoping it will go smoothly. It will be a, an interesting week because in addition to the first week, we are closed on Friday for the holidays. So we're doubling up on all sorts of things throughout the week. But um, we're, we're hoping once we get through the first crazy week, everything will be good and we'll be able to just keep feeding those families all summer long. So that was pretty quick. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. And Thank you so much, Joy. Oh, and Scott's taking it. Bye. I'll, I'll jump back in here. And then um, uh, we had uh, last week, we had a conversation with the superintendent, uh, which, uh, you know, despite, uh, despite the uh, Google Meet virtual uh, nature of it, uh, we had uh, at one point over 90 people in the 
virtual uh, conversation, and you know, and it it was uh, I, I think it was a very productive one. Uh, there was the million dollar question that uh, people wanted to know: uh, What's the fall going to look like? Uh, thankfully, I told them all that uh, I, I didn't know then, but I said uh, we can expect that we will get something from the commissioner's office uh, soon. Uh, that came out uh, late last night uh, and kind of went uh, public this morning um, with uh, the commissioner's guidance on reopening in the fall. Uh, I, I know in the past I have told you that uh, the commissioner was going to uh, tell us what 85 to 90 percent of the fall was going to look like. Um, I, I think the guidance might be more along uh, the defining 15 to 10 percent of what the fall is going to look like. Um, but uh, at, at the moment, I'll, I'll walk through some of the things that uh, that we can expect. And uh, so in uh, on the eighth page of his guidance, uh, I think the key thing it says at this time, uh, our initial requirements are related uh, and related guidance are as followed. At this time, it's, I think very appropriate because uh, some of these things I've seen change every week for the last several weeks. Um, at the moment, it has uh, a requirement that students in grade two and above are wearing masks uh, with kindergarten and grade, uh, grade one encouraged to wear masks. Um, and I know that uh, during the conversation with the superintendent was one of the big concerns. I do think as a district uh, that I, I think yeah, I, I think requiring you know, everyone to have masks. And I fully acknowledge that the younger the kids are, the more challenging it's going to be to, uh, you know, to have them keep the masks. But I think we can work with even our youngest students on that expectation. Uh, all adults um, would be requiring to wear masks and face uh, or face coverings. Um, there are some exceptions there. Uh, in the guidance, and I know that in our last meeting, even some on the school committee were wondering if there were uh, certain health or disability issues. I mean, would there be flexibility in that? And there is that in the um, in the guidance, the guidance that's come out by the state. Um, they talk about these face coverings would be required on buses as well. Um, they talk about physical distancing and what's come out. Uh, we, you know, we've all heard the, you know, maintain six feet apart. Apparently there's some research that has shown in schools, uh, even when you're keeping a meter apart or, you know, roughly three, three feet apart, um, that, that, that has been, uh, that has been working. And, you know, so, you know, so the guidance as it stands at the moment in this says, uh, six feet when feasible, um, uh, three, a three foot minimum distance is allowed. Um, and and I think I, I think we, as a school district, I think are in a much better place than most schools to to be able to to maintain something closer to six feet because we have quite reasonable class sizes you know, across grade levels. Um, you, know, I, you know we you know we don't have you know, classes where you have you know thirty plus kids in a room where you know having get six feet apart wouldn't be feasible. Um, they do talk about in the guidance, um, trying to keep the school divided into groupings. You know, so, uh, you know, so I would, I, I think you could imagine that, uh, that the elementary school, they would, you know, the, the suggestion would be to not have those classrooms mingle, but to try to keep each class, you know, each classroom separated. I think that becomes a little, less possible when we look at our middle schools and high schools. And again, I think relative to many other high schools, um, you know, it talks uh, it talks here in his guidance that uh, uh, that you might want to have the high school operate as a series of many uh, of many high schools that are having passing periods at the same time. I think we have to keep in mind that uh, that when they're thinking about high schools, a lot of times they're thinking about high schools more like the high school that I used to be at that's you know three or four times the size of Monomoy, where you know where when you have a passing period 
you have you know nearly 2,000 students in the hall, that again isn't you know, isn't us. And I think we can go even in our building um, create a situation where you know maybe the eighth grade team has it has a a passing schedule that's different than others. But I think to uh, I, I think it's I, I think it's it's going to be a little more challenging if we try to do things by specific grade levels when we have, you know, we have a building that has classes that have multiple grade levels within them. Um, one of the uh, other, yeah, one of the other pieces here that has changed, uh, and it's uh, again related to the student groupings and class sizes. Uh, the last iterations that I had seen had uh, had these maximum class sizes that of uh, of ten students, uh, you know, and two adults in a classroom. That has been lifted in this, I think, and I, I think that uh, puts us in a much uh, much easier place to bring everybody back. And they uh, they emphasize in in what they're what they've put out that the you know the the primary goal is to get students back into the class back into the classrooms but i think the the thing that um that leaves much to be interpreted in the guidance that has come out is that um school districts are going to be required over the summer and should have these completed by august um plans three different plans and I, I think if you read between the lines on this the state doesn't know what the fall is going to look like so I can't answer that million dollar question that people had in the conversation with me any more today than I could then um, we're supposed to have plans in place and I suspect that the state's trying to buy themselves the the luxury of being able to say uh, as we go into September um, whether it's going to have to be purely remote whether it can be some sort of hybrid that has small numbers of students back in or whether we can have all students back in the buildings following sort of different safety guidelines than before so we have to come up with a plan for how we would operate if we have in-person learning with new safety protocols where everybody's back in our buildings, some sort of hybrid where maybe half of our students are in at a time and, uh, and some, you know, some sort of situation like it has been where we have purely remote learning. They do emphasize in this that, uh, that, the, uh, that particularly at the high school level that if it's remote learning that we should be seeing full school days for our high school students that you know that they should be getting you know, you know an hour of english you know not you know not 12 minutes of you know not 12 minutes of english with stuff you know with stuff posted online um but you know but again there's a there's a lot to um you know to interpret here uh, it was clear when we were talking uh with parents um in the uh in the conversation with the superintendent uh, that there's a want to see um, much more uh, face time with, um, you know, with the classes. Um, again, uh, particularly the older, you know, the older, you know, the students are, you know, there's this need, you know, this, this need for more time you know, with math, more time with, you know, with English. Not saying that it's not there with the younger students. I think we, you know, we are also, you know, hearing and very sensitive to what we see in the surveys of our families, that there are many of our families, including many of our staff who have younger children, that you know that school plays an important role in allowing the parents to get back to work, you know, in their you know jobs in the private sector or their jobs in our classrooms. And I think we're going to have to be very cognizant as we develop this plan uh, for reopening schools. Um, if we have to go uh, in some sort of hybrid situation, how do we go and ensure that um, you know that we're getting uh, families to a place that they can get back to work and our teachers so that they can be uh, in a in a situation where they can provide a day's instruction to students. So 
Uh, it, this, you know, as I said, it, it just came out um, uh, late last night. It was sent out to superintendents and uh, went out publicly uh, this morning. Um, uh, I'll go uh, start chatting with the administrative team early next week on this, and we will be connecting with our staff and teachers and um, working with them collaboratively to come up with a three uh, a, a three different um, approaches, a, a in-person hybrid and remote learning approach uh, that we're required to have in writing posted publicly and submitted to DESE you know, sometime by August. And, uh, and then we'll have to go and see um, what, you know, what COVID-19 looks like as we go into the fall to where uh, the state public health officials feel we can be at for reopening. Great, thank you, Dr. Carpenter. Um, I'll start off, Brooke, with questions, discussions. Um, I just had a question. I've, I've just been hearing rumbles of people possibly doing homeschooling if there was a thought that, you know, we would not be returning to school in some capacity. And it may not be a large enough sampling um, that's that it's worth to send out a survey, but would it be beneficial to send out a survey to kind of get a feel on who's doing homeschooling versus coming back given the, cir the circumstances and would that help your team when devising these three different plans that we're presenting? If, if I mean, what if 50%, I don't think so, but you know, what if 50% of the kids were, their parents were like, absolutely not, we're not returning to school until we know that there's a vaccine and this virus is gone. How would that impact our plans? Or do we even need the survey because then the plans would actually, if there were fewer kids, those plans would, still work they just would be you know smaller class sizes yeah I, I i think that we i think we we have put out a survey already uh, that wasn't specifically you know in the fall are you going to homeschool but we can we can tease out from that and and we do know that there are some families including some that were part of you know part of the discussion that were raising you know that were raising their concerns and asking you know asking you know sort of the what ifs you know you know what if we felt our child should only be in school for half a day and you know could they go in the morning you know and there and the you know, parent that was raising the question was you know sort of thinking you know the longer the longer they're in a bigger group you know the the greater the chance that they're that they could catch something so could you know could they limit it to you know what if we just wanted to send two hours a day and what we you know what i explained to folks is if we're in some sort of Hybrid situation where uh, where um, students are both in school and at home to reduce the density of students in classrooms. If that's where um, you know where the state's suggesting we need to be, that you know that it's entirely possible <laughs> that for many families that we could be broadcasting out. Yeah. You know, so you know. So let's say we have a um, uh, an English lesson that's happening in a high school classroom, half of the students are at home, half of the students are there in the classroom, that lesson can be broadcast out with an expectation that everybody's there in attendance, it's just only half of them are in the classroom. But one of the other things we were clearly hearing from the, uh, from the parents in the, um, in, the uh, uh, in the superintendent chat, is that they want it to make sure that whatever the guidance is that goes out that we make what happens online mandatory for our you know for our students so you know we had and and we you know we explained that uh that during the distance learning 1.0 and 2.0 we you know we were leaving some flexibility there for you know, for families um in case there were uh there were some families that uh, that the student might be uh, better able to go and uh, uh, do the English lesson with support from a parent when the parent was home at the end of their workday. Um, so we left the assignments sort of asynchronous when they could be due. Um, I, I think the, what we were hearing from the parents is that they you know, is that they want it to um, to be you know, to have that. You know, it very clearly defined that 
if you're in that English class that's, that's a hybrid model, you're expected to be there, attendance is gonna be taken. Uh, in terms of the, the survey results, when we surveyed the families and, and there was sort of a homeschooling piece, uh, only 4.6% um, had indicated that they intended to homeschool. And I, I think there was, there was some relief when parents heard that, oh, we could make a decision <laughs> in a hybrid situation where our child could be staying at home and 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 being part of those you know, of that English lesson or the math lesson that comes after that you know but the expectation would be that you could be doing this from home you just need to be there you know for the whole you know for the whole lesson and that's you know that would be the expectation I apologize Scott was that survey done pre covid with with the number of kids that are currently getting homeschooled, that was a survey that we most recently did. Right, right. Okay, and, thank you. And we, Sorry. We we also we also see uh, see a fairly parallel number. We we um, uh, just uh, just the, the, I could probably go pull up an email if I grabbed a different screen, but uh, we just did a survey on uh, with families on tr bus transportation. Yeah, you know, who and yeah you know, who plans to ride the bus who doesn't plan to ride the bus and you know and you know and you can look at the bus transportation survey and you have you, you can see a set of a set of families there that you know they're kind of indicating um, they're you know that they're quite concerned about just going to school period all right great um sharon uh yes so i think i'm on mic i'm concerned about the um 21% or whatever that was of the survey where there are children, parents, um, grandparents, um, and we didn't do teachers, but of the, I guess it's only preschool through grade two that possibly could be unmasked would be a safety issue for some population. Are we thinking that those uh, people that fall into that category will be clustered in certain groups so um, they don't have exposure. Are you, are you talking staff, Sharon? I'm talking about that there, uh, I'm sure there's staff that fall into this category, but in the survey uh, that was mentioned last school committee meeting, I think it was 21% of um, those surveyed said that either the student, the parent or household member had a serious illness that um, I'm pretty sure those people would not want to be in a room with unmasked anyone. Uh, so I'm just wondering if we're thinking uh, to facilitate that so we don't get inundated with, um, I mean, I, I guess they could bring a doctor's note, but something so that we encourage those kids to come to school in some way where it can be safe for them? I, I think I think the whole idea would be, and it's it's one of the one of the paramount <laughs> things that the commissioner is getting it gets at is, you know, is the goals to get students back to school safely. And 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 that's that's part of what school districts are responsible for coming up with. You know, here are these three scenarios that that we want you to develop plans around, you know, a scenario where everybody's back, but back safely, mm -hmm. that that the the risk of COVID is starting to escalate um, so that you're reducing density that much more. How are you reducing density and doing that safely? And then, uh, you know, uh, the risk of COVID is, is back to very high um, and it's all remote learning. What will remote learning look like 3.0? And, and, and again, I think they're, they're again, emphasizing that, uh, you know, that, you know, that we need to uh, make sure that we're, uh, that we're seeing more learning <laughs> happening across all districts in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and, and there's, there's money that they've put into this. It looks like that uh, districts are going to be eligible to receive, um, yeah, to receive uh, money uh, to help defray the costs to implement these plans 
and then there's additional money that uh, that is talked about in the document that has come out for districts <laughs> that uh, that need to secure technology to make a hybrid or a remote learning possible. I'm not talking about remote learning at all. I'm talking about the children who need to be in the classroom with all kids masked. Um, would we group those kids that um, that have a special issue um, so they wouldn't be subjected to you know, having a person at risk be likely to catch something. I, I, I think I think we're going to have to look at you know who who the individuals are and come up with something. I I don't I, I we have to keep in mind that you know that when when the families are responding, they're at all different grade levels. So you know so grouping you know grouping mm -hmm. at different grade levels in different buildings. Um, and I, I, you know, one of the things that I, I shared with parents and I you know, still disagree with where the, the commissioner's guidance is at, I, I do think that, uh, that we need to have an expectation <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, and work with students of all ages when it comes to masks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell. <clears throat> A minor point, Scott, but the thought strikes me kind of bouncing off what Sharon was talking about, but a different theme. Would there be a guideline for at least out of state new students uh, relative to being quarantined prior to arriving in our school? Uh, again, it's uh, probably just a handful of kids, but I suppose uh, with the tri state doing what they're doing, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut people coming from certain states are gonna be required. I don't know how they're gonna do that. However, the question is uh, new students to us. Yeah, I, I, I think that we'll have to, I think things like that are gonna to have to be part of the, of the guidance. One of the, you know, one of the things in the commissioner's guidance is that there'll be a, a COVID czar Zyrena at each, at, at each building that has to be designated. I presume, it, you know, just, Given the initial guidance, um, I, I presume we'd want to go and look look at our uh, our uh, nursing staff as as being the health experts in that building and coming up with um, you know with policies and protocols. You know, I I I'm I think I would take it a step further. Um, you know, this was. Uh, you know, bringing you know, bringing Rory out to the Air Force Academy in in, uh, in Colorado was the first time that I've been tangibly off Cape in months, and uh, it, you know, and I've gone from you know from you know, you know, from uh, heading to Home Depot, wearing a mask where everybody else is wearing a mask, to walking out the door here to any restaurant or any business, and there's hardly anybody wearing a mask anywhere. In fact, I, I think the only place that there was a requirement that you had to have a mask on was on the Air Force Academy itself. And, you know, so I, you know, so, you know, I think we keep seeing things in the news on these upticks that are happening in a lot of states that are opening things up. And I am quite thankful that that uh, the New England area states have been trying to manage this and that we've seen, you know, the numbers in New York and New Jersey and Massachusetts, you know, continue to tick down, 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 even though they blossomed, uh, they blossomed early with this. And my, you know, my hope is, you know, that that continues as we go into the fall. But I think we're going to have, you know, some of the challenges we're going to have to deal with is, it's not just the the new kid coming, uh, you know, coming to the school, but you know, but when people go on different little vacations, or you know, yeah, yeah. So when when the superintendent, you know, here I'm sitting here going, it's like okay, um, you know, I, I was just at a I was just at a gathering where I was the only one wearing a mask with lots of people, and you know, there was there was a lovely sign, and it said. It said there was only ten people. You know, this pavilion could only have ten people at it. Um, 
there was probably 200. Um, and, you know, and it's, you know, so I, I, I do worry what, you know, what we're going to have to look at as a, you know, as, um, you know, when do we quarantine, who quarantines, and, and what sort of guidance are we providing to families on, you know, if you've traveled off Cape, out of state, you know, you know, how long should, how long should, you know, should, th you know, should we see uh, uh, families quarantining for the kids back in school? That was a great question, Terry. Um, Ms. Scott. Um, Scott, so I, I skimmed through most of the guidance this morning, and it says that you have to create the three plans as a just in case, or I guess ultimately, when do you come out and say, and who makes that final decision? Do you think the governor is going to come and say, you know, you're going to go with plan B or going to kind of give you, I mean, I, yeah. I anticipate that. So I have yeah, gonna be good, the option. Yeah. Good question. I have, I have no idea if, if districts are going to be given the latitude to decide whether they're at stage one, stage two, or stage three, or is, you know, it, it has largely been the state dictating which, which phase, you know, which phase we're in. So I, I presume that, that, that we'll get the edict from the state that, uh, that we need to all go to remote, or we can be in a hybrid, or we can be, we're at a place to open up with safety protocols, or we're, at a place finally that we can open up as we had in the past, um, but I, you know, I, I think scheduling this is going to be a ginormous nightmare, and uh, and I've you know, I've already started to talk with uh, with Gen Police, and I'll spend some time uh, with you know Adam O'Shea, but but I think we have to we have to think about. How do you schedule your middle school and high school where kids have schedules that they follow, and and they have more than you know more than just their teacher, and be in a situation so that we have the plasticity to shift from one plan to another plan without disrupting everything for our students, and you know so I I I think conceivably. You know, we need to make sure that at the high school, you know, every student is taking five core academics, and that's the thing that will, no matter which plan we're in, is going to always be consistent. And you know, and then here's you know, here's where we, you know, if we have to go from you know from regular classroom to some sort of hybrid, this is how the district is going to flex. But this is what's going to stay consistent. It's 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 going to be quite a challenge. The other the other huge challenge behind that, and this is where I need to sit down with uh, Joe Powers and and you know maybe reach out to the Harwich Selectmen to have them understand it. Is you know Chatham has passed a budget for us that it's a budget based on a pre COVID nineteen, and what the commissioner is emphasizing and what he's putting out is that it's to do to do what's required in these three scenarios you need more than what your budget was you know it's it, you know there's there's sort of a need for more not a need for less you call it and, like a 112 budget plus or something yeah and you know and i you know and that's that's where um you know we you know we've talked about a budget scenario where we reduce staff by 13.5 ftes I, I can't see a hybrid scenario working well where we reduce by 13.5 FTEs and accomplish the things that that educationally we're supposed to do and that that our families and our towns need us to do as the school system. You know, so again, that will be you know, a lot of outreach that needs to happen in the next in the next several days to have you know, to have the towns understand, you know, particularly Harwich, which hasn't set their budget yet, um, what what the schools are gonna need if we have to be flexible in our planning. Thank you. Um, Joanne, Ms. Sheehan. Uh, 
So I confess to skimming through this. Um, I had a, a book that was a little bit more interesting, but I just kept reading through it. And I had a problem figuring out lunches. Can they use the cafeteria? Can they not? Are they bringing their lunch to school? That I, and I kept going back through it. Um, it, the school committee will be delivering lunches to each of the classrooms. And making them, I hope. Yeah, um, yep. I, I, I would imagine that in these scenarios that we're, that we're looking at, we're probably looking at, um, at students not going to the cafeteria, but the cafeteria, you know, you know taking orders and, you know, and coming to, you know, coming to classrooms. But again, if, if you think about what happens at the high school, and I think we've, we've been proud as a district that we've had Jossum at the high school, I, I would say that Jossum probably doesn't work in this scenario. You, you, you know, we'd have to come up with some, everybody needs to be in a place, uh, but, but we can't, you know, we can't in this scenario have, you know, have 620 students that are all moving around sort of free to be where they want to be at any given time. And that's, and, you know, so, you know, so there's some loss that's going to happen with, you know, within this planning, you know, because, you know, because we can, you know, we can come up with something and say, oh, well, this is how we're going to do it. And we have to submit these plans. We have to, I, I presume what's going to come out is that we need to go and present it to the school committee, get the school committee to approve it, send it to DESE and have DESE approve it. And, you know, and it has to pass the safety muster. And I think, yeah, I think, um, a scenario where you're in the plan, in, in these plans, it's saying that you you need to keep groups separate. Well, you can imagine an elementary school that you keep all the classrooms separate, but then have everybody come together in the cafeteria. It, it, you know, sort of violates that piece. You know, so I think I think we'd have to look at you know at the elementary schools. Do we have recess in some different areas of the campus? You know, to spread everybody out, and it, it's it's happening at different times. You know, do we at the middle school do we have fresh air time on different fields for different you know for different groupings and and try to you know, you know try to get creative in how we you know how we do things. But you know, lunch you know, lunch is not going to be uh, be how it's happened in the past. In fact, uh, you know, part of the plan say you might look at your cafeteria or your library as spaces to break. Have use for classrooms so that you can decrease density. So you know, so the you know, part of the su suggestion is spread out through your building as much as you can. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. So many, so many facets to this, and things I'm sure you guys are going to be working on. Um, I do remember my in kindergarten the the uh, lunch staff delivering snack time. I remember those cheese sticks were amazing. So. It can be done. Um, so absolutely. Are there any other questions uh, for Dr. Carpenter at this time or discussions? Um, a lot of great points brought up. I'm sure we could bring up a million more, but I'm sure he's also aware of all the, uh, the multiple facets going on. So um, seeing none, I'm going to move on to our action items. Um, the first item would be the year-end action items. Um, this was discussed at the June 11th meeting. Katie is prepared. Um, motions for the regional transportation account vote and the food services negative balance vote. Do I have someone who would like to make a motion? I know that Joe's saying no, he doesn't want to make a motion. <laughs> um, does anyone have them in front of them at the moment? Oh, Ms. Scott. I'm getting there. Sorry, I had to go to computer. All right, I move to approve to cover the following negative balances in the food services account, the amount of $1,456.69. Is there a second? Mary, second. I'm gonna roll call if you can turn your mics on, please. Um, Ms. Scott? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Sheehan? Yes. Uh, Mr. Rossiello? Aye. Ms. Stout? Aye. Ms. Henderson? 
And I am I. Motion carries unanimous. Um, and the next motion, Ms. Scott. I move to approve an offset of $177,529.50 to be applied to the FY22 transportation portion of the assessment. Thank you. Is there a second? Joanne Sheehan, second. And I'm going to roll call um, Ms. Scott. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. Ms. Sheehan. Yes. Ms. Draciello. Aye. Ms. Stout. Aye. Ms. Henderson? Aye. And I am aye. Motion carries and unanimous. Um, next item on the agenda would be the superintendent, superintendent evaluation as presented at the June 11th meeting by Ms. Sheehan. Um, at this time, we're looking for a motion to approve the evaluation. So moved. Second. Thank you. Second by Mr. Russell. Questions or discussion? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna roll call. Ms. Scott? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Sheehan? Yes. Ms. Draciello? Aye. Ms. Stout? Aye. Ms. Henderson? Aye. And aye, motion carries, that's unanimous. Um, next item would be the second reading of policy files, ACAB harassment and ACAB SH sexual harassment as presented at the June 11th meeting. Is there a motion? And you can put both in the same motion. I move to approve, I'm sorry, Ms. Madam Chair. Ms. Scott. I move to approve policy ACAB harassment and ACAB-SH sexual harassment as presented at our last meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Henderson. I will roll call. Ms. Scott? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Sheehan? Yes. Ms. Draciello? Aye. Ms. Stout? Aye. Ms. Henderson? And I'm I. Uh, motion carries. Vote is unanimous. Um, appointment. Oh, did we? We already did. Miss. Uh, did that. We did that. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, declaration of surplus. I know that was an additional um, packet that we got. Does anyone have that in front of them at this time? Uh, Mr. Osiello, would you like to present the surplus? I will try to read all these together rather than page by page, if that's okay. That's fine, as long <clears> as <throat> the schools are the same. If they're different, just break them up by school. Okay, fair enough. Um, looking through this quickly, I can say they all pertain to the middle school. So that we, I move that we <laughs> declare as surplus <clears throat> the following items located at the regional middle school. And that would be 37 Promethium PRM, PRM AE02-01, Active Expression 2 Learner Response Clickers, 117 Promethium PRM AE01-01, Active Expression 2 Learner Response Clickers, in addition, <clears throat> declare obsolete 10 HP Mini 5103 netbooks, two HP Mini 100E netbook, 16 Acer Aspire 1CM-2 netbooks, uh, one Lenovo ThinkPad X100E netbook, one MNA, MNA um, I'm looking at uh, Technician, I believe, Companion Touch 2600 Netbook, one Acer Aspire One Basic Netbook, one HP Mini <laughs> Netbook, and continuing in the middle school, declaring obsolete four Apple A. 1186 computer towers. And that would conclude the motion for disposal of surplus materials at the middle school. All right, great. Is there a second? Second. Second from Joanne. And I'm going to roll call Ms. Scott. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. Ms. Sheehan. Yes. Ms. Draciello. Aye. Ms. Stout. Aye. Ms. Henderson. Aye. 
Okay, and I, uh, motion carries, vote is unanimous. Um, and presentation of the warrants. And at this time we have public comment available if anyone has anything additional they'd like to say this evening or share in the public comment segment. Uh, Mr. Gust, Gust, can never say your last name, Charles. Charles. <laughs> Thank you, Charles Gruska, 16 Marie Ave Harwich. I realized that in my previous comments <laughs> evening as I was listening my positive uh, interactions with all the administrative leadership team I may have left out the name of Joy Jordan uh, I don't know if I did but if I did that was uh, certainly totally unintentional because I had extremely a uh, positive warm welcome uh, interaction with her as I've had with all of the rest of the administrative team uh, also wanted to mention uh, as we've talked about graduation this evening uh, there was a real positive vibe that uh, my wife and I experienced in the town of Harwich, at least, as we watched the graduation parade. Uh, and I think there were a lot of people in the community who had nothing, no one involved in the graduation uh, that had come out and were thrilled to be out and have something to celebrate and to celebrate the, the school system. And I think it only builds positive vibes and respect uh, for the school system. i sorry to hear about the accident. I have a feeling though that there may be some pressure to make this a, a traditional event. And also I've heard a lot of feedback in the community of people impressed, impressed by the act, action of the administration at the high school to go out on the buses and to hand deliver the caps and gowns, but particularly to hand deliver the letters to each student written by teachers. Uh, that doesn't happen in every community. Another uh, sign of how this school system emphasizes the caring dimension as well as the competence dimension and why if I were a parent of children uh, moving to the Cape, I would look to Monomoy to where I'd want to settle to have my children go to school. Why if I were still in the practice and looking for a place to become part of, of a leadership team, I'd certainly want to apply to Monomoy uh, because the teachers of this district are, are amazing. It's been the experience that I've, I've had in working with them and, and being a grandparent and, and interacting. Um, and so you know, kudos to all as we conclude this school year. And thank you again for allowing the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Thank you, Charles, very, very much. All right. So that would conclude our meeting, folks. Um, can I have a motion to I adjourn? I have a motion to adjourn the meeting tonight. Second. Oh, Scott. Oh, Scott, darn it. Um, I, I think that there may be um, results from the election while we've, uh, while we've been on. I, I believe, uh, unless I'm, unless I'm getting- adjourn. <laughs> Unless, unless I'm getting the uh, uh, the news feed wrong, I believe that Miss Scott and Miss Zebrat Long were reelected. Pray, Nancy. I was going to ask you to call me later on tonight for that message. You know, so that's Thank good you. news. Congratulations, Sorry, guys. Good going. <laughs> with us for another three years. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, no, we're allowed to resign uh, from the committee in protest. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph, thanks, Joe. That is not kind. Love, love. Oh, sorry, that. sorry, I interrupted your vote. <laughs> okay, yes, there, there is a, there was a motion to adjourn. There's a second by Miss Scott, and I'm going to roll call Miss Scott. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. Miss Miss Sheehan. Yes. Um, Mr. Osiello. Congratulations, colleagues, and <laughs> Thank I. Thank you, Miss Stout. Aye. And Miss Henderson. Aye. All right, motion carries. Uh, meeting adjourned, 7.48 p.m. See you again. Be well, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Congratulations, Jackie. Bye, Katie. Bye, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to come back and visit us. <laughs> She's like, ha, 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 ha. No. Yeah. You can visit us on Zoom. It'll be fine. It'll be fun. Oh. Welcome to the you club, Katie. <laughs> I'll catch up with you, Katie. <laughs> we're going to bomb your, our, uh, not bomb in a bad way, but we're going to come in into the building to have to say goodbye next week. I know. Oh, I know. Oh. We may have to do something extra special. Well, thank you all. Um, it's been a good time. It's been a pleasure.
Yep. Yes, Wednesdays on 50. Yeah. Pleasure was all ours. All ours. You're amazing. And, Incredible. And Look at me. Michael will be a wonderful up. addition to the too. district. Okay. I don't know how we're going to do it without you. <laughs> oh, you'll, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Thank you all. We're just going to keep calling you. Yeah. Call, I'm going to say. Calling you and calling you. This. <laughs> it's good. Okay. Right, congratulations, you? Nancy and Jackie. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I'm going to end it. Bye. <laughs> Katie, I just want to say it has been a pleasure to work with you. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. Will be best. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. I just want Bye. you to know that. All right. Bye-bye.